Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, this is Hessian Tung. Yeah, from my J uh, International Show and Marketing Department. So nice to see you again. Yeah, this is our second episode of our morphology webinar. So uh, as we said and in the first episode, and we are willing to make this webinar is a platform for our lab professional and also the pathologies share their experience and share their knowledge. So, so we are, we are coming, coming again. again. And, and in this, this episode, episode, we, we are, are very glad to, uh, we have invited the most prestigious, prestigious uh, hospital in Thailand. Chulalongkorn University, Dr. Chudi Tan to share her experience on the playlet detections, the, the pitfalls of the playlet count and its solutions. And another topic is the, uh, we are very glad to invite Dr. Chia and, and he is a physician, a physician from, from St. Louis, St. Louis Medical, uh, Medical Center. Center. He will share, he will share the, the experience on, on uh, uh, how a morphologist can help for the leukemia diagnosis, especially in uh, lymph nodes. So yeah, this is uh, yeah. As we, is, I am willing to to make it this platform for an academic event. So next. Uh, I would like to hand in this this uh, platform to uh, Dr. Chudita to share yeah his uh, her experience. Welcome, Dr. Chudita. Good good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, so uh, thank 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 Hansen for introduction. Oh. So. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Can you hear your voice? Okay. Oh, really? Um, so can 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 you hear me right now? Hello. Can... Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Please can you Yeah, yeah. So uh good afternoon everybody. Um uh, uh, how to say hello in Thailand. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Mile Medical International and Miley Thailand for giving me an opportunity to talk to you all today. And today uh my topic is the pick for or pellet cow and its solution. Um, okay. So in relation to this presentation, I declare the relevance uh, of financial interest in the products or company. And my presentation, oh, sorry that my slide didn't move. Okay. So my presentation today will be divided into four parts. First, I would like to give you uh, an overview of Petlet and the method of Petlet cow that, that was used uh, right now. And third, I will uh, give you a brief summary of the pitfall of Petlet cow on the hematology analyzer and its solution. And lastly, uh, I will touch on a new pellet cow parameter, uh, which is called pellet X or hybrid, and show more interesting case that we have experienced when using this parameter in our hospital. So the pellet uh, are subcellular fragments derived from megakaryocytes in the bone marrow, circulating in the butt as a small dish. The size is allowed just only three microns, and it do not have a nucleus and just have only the cytoplasm. In the peripheral basmia, 
they appear as a long or oval shape and play a key important role for the hemostasis and thrombosis. The, more, the normal range of pellet count in healthy individuals is around 150 to 400,000 uh, per microliter. And the pellet count, especially when it is a thrombocytopenia, is one of the critical parameters in patient care. The accurate and reproducibility of pellet count is really important for the clinician. And there are three methods for estimating the pellet count. The first one is the microscopic method, uh, which composed of manual counting and the pellet estimation from the bus smear. Second is the immunological pellet. And the last one is a new alternative method which is due the automated hematology analyzer. So uh, let me show you the detail of three methods by starting with microscopic method. The manual count uh, is a traditional or standard method for a long time and can be performed by using HEMA cytometer with a face contact. Uh, although this, this method is a standard method, but this method has several disadvantages, including uh, time consuming, laborious, subjective, and also have a high inter observer coefficiency of variation. So, the pellet estimation from bat smear is currently used in mode labs. Uh, by using the right inta staining, the number of pellets are count in the 10 oil field and then report it uh, as an average number of pellets in an oil field, which multiplied by 20,000. This method also has the same disadvantage as manual count, including time consuming, uh, labor intensive, and have a high imprecision and low sensitivity. Another one is an uh, immunological pellet count or immunopellet counting. Uh, it is a uh, new gold standard that recommended by ICHH and IHLH. Uh, it has more advantage over the manual microscopic method, which is large number of cells can be analyzed uh, and several parameters rather than morphological characteristics can be used for identifying cells. However, uh, this method has several disadvantages such as a uh, specialized operational skill are needed, and the reagent and instrument is too expensive, and the sample preparation process is very laborious and time consuming. For the pellet staining, it can be directly labeled the receptor, such as a uh, gycoprotein 1B, gycoprotein 2B, 3A, by using anti CD41 or CD61. Uh, so pellet can be identified like, like this in the first cytopathy uh, as a CD41 or CD61 positive cell and can count uh, by using the labor cell to pellet ratio method. From this formula, the pellet count can be calculated uh, by dividing the number of known labor cell count, which determined by impedance analyzer uh, with the ratio of the number of labor cell even uh, to the pellet even. So uh, last but not least is the automated hematology analyzer. Uh, this method offers many advantages for high throughput laboratory, including faster learn allow time, labor saving, and high reliability. A new generation of automatic analyzer were developed to enumerate the pellet number in blood with excellent precision and accuracy, depending on a wide, uh, varying uh, technology and method, including the impedance, uh, which is the O1, the optical pellet, and another one is the optical plus the, in, uh, the fluorescent pellet counting. This slide shows that currently many automated hematology analyzers can perform the pellet count by two basic methods, uh, electrical impedance and optical density or optical fluorescence. Although 
most automated analyzer use either method separately. A newer equipment can now use both optical and impedance techniques uh, simultaneously. Like in uh, and here is the principle of the impedance counting. We also know it as the quarter principle after it invented by uh, Sir Warren Coulter. The principle uh, based on the cell that is a poor electrical conductor. When the cell passing through the aperture, it will induce an increase of uh, the electrical resistance. This cell will cause a resistance power that allows cell counting. Furthermore, the magnitude of the peak is directly related to the cell volume. Due to pellet has the smallest size comparing to the red by cell and white by cell, it has the lowest resistance power here. So the impedance pellet counting is typically performed in the presence of the red by cell with a count simultaneously. So the pellet can differentiate from the cell based on the histogram analysis of the accumulated resistance event, meaning uh, that size which allow to, to 20 centolith and the threshold used to find optimal separation between two cell population, uh, which allow six micron for headlet and uh, 90 uh, centolith for labor cell. However, impedance pellet analysis which we know that it's based on size, has limitation in the identification and discrimination of pellets from interference particles with the same size. Uh, so there are two possibilities of the interference. The first one is the large pellet or pellet clumping or aggregation. They will count as a labor cell and cause the fully uh, low pellet count. count. Another one is the red blood cell fragment and microcytic red blood cell. They are count as a pellet and cause the fully high pellet count. This is the limitation of pellet I. Another one, the next one, is the pellet count by using the optical or scatter measurement. This method is based on the light scatter measurement. The forward scatter can identify the pellet size whereas the size scatter help to identify the internal structure. This dual light scatter can help to reduce some interference, uh, including microcytic or fragmented red blood cells. The third one is the fluorescent uh, with the uh, optical pellet cow. This one uh, has a higher sensitivity due to the staining of the cell by fluorescence. Uh, as I showed you earlier, that forward scatter can identify the size of cell. And the size scatter helps to identify the internal structure. For the fluorescent signal, it can help to measure the RNA or DNA content that are uh, in, in, inside the cell. So this slide shows the principle of pellet O or pellet optical staining by fluorescence. As you can see from this figure, the red blood cell and also it fragmented do not contain RNA. Therefore, it does not have the fluorescent signal. Uh, whereas the reticulocyte pellet and in natural pellet form contain an RNA inside. So they show the fluorescent signal and the lowest fluorescent signal intensity is the natural pellet, this one. So the pellet O have more advantages than pellet I. Uh, it helps to reduce some interference. As you can see from this uh, scattergram, the microcytic, uh, this one, microcytic red blood cell and the large pellet or cyan pellet can be clearly uh, identified from the normal population. The microcytic red blood cell uh, and also the red blood cell fragment are the non fluorescent dot. And the large pellet have a stronger fluorescent signal than normal pellet. As we know that the pellet count by automated 
analyzer offer many advantages for high throughput laboratories, including faster turnaround time, labor, uh, labor saving, and high reliability. However, there are also some pitfalls uh, for watch out and uh, its solution for coping with. For the pellet cow, there are two major errors. The first one is the fully decrease of the pellet cow is uh, less than 150,000. Uh, and another one is the fully increase of the pellet cow. Uh, the, the important one uh, is the fully decrease in, in the clinical uh, management. So, uh, let's start with the situation that caused the decrease in pellet cow. The first one is the pre analytical error. For the pre analytical error, it might be due to an inappropriate but correction technique, such as improper filling the tube with the blood and inadequate but mixing. For the EDTA tube, it requires at least 8 to 10 times inversion to mix the bug with anti-coagulant. Sometimes uh, the pre-analytical occur as the microclot, and you can see it in, in the bus smear that you found from fibrin in the bus smear, or sometimes you can found the pellet cam. For uh, this, this one, uh, it's not invisible, by, uh, but it can be identified by, by bus smear. And for uh, finding the pellet cam, it can be identified by uh, found at, it, at the end of the slide. You have to focus on the end of the slide and you can find the pellet cam if it appears. So what to do uh, if you found a bug smear like this? Uh, you should reject the specimen and ask for the recollection of the bug with an appropriate bug collection technique and signaling it as a coagulated sample and have a p analytical non-compliance. So move to the second one, the pellet cam or pellet application. The pellet cam uh, is defined as uh, the presence of the at least uh, five attached uh, pellets together. Like right here, you can see it on, on the bus near. And the pellet cam, or sometimes we call EDTA dependent pseudothrombocytopenia or PTCP, is a layer in vivo phenomenon. Um, it is mainly caused by IgG and IgM autoantibody directed against epitope on pellet surface, glycoprotein 2B3A. EDTA induces a conformational change in EDT, uh, in glycoprotein 2 BTA and resulting in pellet agglutination. So there are five major diagnostic criteria uh, for EDTA induced uh, pseudothrombocytopenia. The first one is the pellet count should be less than 100,000. Second one is uh, it is occur in EDTA sample at the room temperature. The third one is the is a time dependent decreasing in pellet cow. The fourth one is the clump or pellet aggregation should be present in EDTA tube. And last one, there is no correlation or relation between the sign and symptom related with low pellet cow. So uh, Currently, there are three alternative methods for uh, soaping a uh, pellet application or pellet clamp. The first one, you can warm in the sample uh, to 37 degrees Celsius due to most of the anti glycoprotein 2 b 3 a and whole antibody. So it can be separate when keep it warm at 30 degrees, uh, 37 degrees Celsius. The second one uh, have to recollect the bat sample by using other anticoagulant uh, bacteria. One thing that should be considered if you're using uh, any anticoagulant is if the dilution factor must be multiplied back 
especially when using the system. The pellet count should be collected by multiplying with uh, 1.1 as the uh, ratio of the but uh, versus the anticoagulant. And the third one, the last one, is the adding amino glycoside antibiotic into the EDTA anticoagulant sample and mixing vigorously allow five minutes. And then the blood sample will be remeasured again by the automated analysis. So the uh, highly noted that uh, this all method only solve the pellet cam phenomenon just only on some sample and it is not effective for all. So I also have some case of pellet cam uh, to share with you. And this data was found when we used the myelin hematology in our hospital around five years ago. And I would like to credit uh, this data to uh, Ms. Lawantia so Wan Ying for a very nice data that, that she tried to collect it. For the first case, uh, you can find in here that during the routine uh, EDTA blood sample was measured and the pellet count by pellet I mode show thrombocytopenia with just only uh, 18,000 in both uh, routine and research parameter. And there is no pellet clumping fact. Oh, sorry. So, however, due to the workflow of an automated pellet cow is setting like this, although the pellet eye histogram is normal, um, if the pellet is less than 50,000, it should be reanalyzed by the reticulocyte mode, and the pellet O should be uh, selected for report. And here, in this case, the pellet cow were reanalyzed by reticulocyte mode, and the pellet O show the pellet cow was increased to around uh, 130,000, comparing to the pellet I is just only uh, 70,000, uh, 17,000. Then uh, we review the bus smear and found few pellet come in an EDTA bus sample. Our question on that time is the pellet cow from pellet O mode. This is correct. Can we use the pellet O to report in this patient? Uh, so after that, we try to prove it by using the citrate but from the same patient to analyze the pellet number by using the reticulocyte cow. Uh, we found that pellet O show the pellet cow allow 100. If we multiply it by 1.1, the collected pellet cow is allow uh, 11, um, 110,000. And this pellet is similar to pellet cow in an EDTA sample. So this slide shows the comparison uh, between the peripheral blood smear uh, of the EDTA and citrate blood. And you can see that the citrate but do not have pellet gram, uh, whereas the EBTA have it. So the second case uh, is the pellet count. This, this case, in this case, uh, it didn't show any fact on the pellet gram. And pellet I show slightly pellet count number around 100,000. However, uh, accidentally, the Slide review show few pellet clamp like this. So then we try to reanalyze uh, the pellet cow by using uh, reticulocyte mode. And the pellet cow show a bit different between pellet O and pellet I, which is uh, 100 to the 200,000 respectively. And uh, in addition, the pellet clamp was shown after we use the reticulocyte mode. In this case, we also try to use the alternative method as I mentioned earlier, uh, such as for warming it at uh, 30, 7 degrees Celsius, five minutes uh, using the heparinite bath and adding the carnamycin and then reanalyze by using both pellet I and O mode. We found that 
um, in this case, warming the sample would not tell. You can see this one O and I have the equal amount uh, of the smaller amount of pellet. But the addition of canamycin help for separate of pellet from, from its clamping. On that time, it five years ago, we didn't know that uh, why a new automated analyzer can help to count the pellet in case of pellet clamping. And here is then an answer after that. Lastly, uh, there are several steps in the analyzer that help to solve the pellet clamping, including uh, heating and vigorously mixing by stir bar and uh, adding the depolymerized reagent for destroying of uh, the pellet aggregation. So uh, move to the third part, the pit part, the third part of pit for that caused the folly decrease uh, is with the large and giant pellet. For the size of pellet uh, is aggregated by comparison with an labeled cell or by using a micrometer according to a large pellet uh, have the size between a half or an entire labor cell of four to seven micron. But a giant pellet is a bigger or larger than a labor cell is more than uh, seven micron. And large pellet or even giant pellet are found in various conditions uh, such as myeloproliferative disease. So the giant pellet can give an underestimation of pellet count, especially uh, on the impedance count. So you can see from this, the histogram of pellet no return to the baseline, but it's uh, rising like this. And if possible, a pellet count by another method, such as the optical fluorescent count is recommended. And so how to report in this? case if you found large or giant pellet, it's recommend to use another counting method such as pellet four and report it instead of the pellet I. And in the report of the CDC, you should mention that giant pellet and found. So the last one uh, of the pit for when pellet have a folly uh, decreased is the pellet satellitism. So pellet satellitism is a land, uh, in vitro phenomenon that typically seen in the EDTA uh, anticoagulated duct and induced by adherence of the pellet to the mature white blood cell, especially for the neutral field, and forming like this as a low set. Uh, pellet satellitism uh, has also been reported about the lymphocyte and the lymphoma cells also. So how to report uh, when you file like this? Uh, the first one, you can use the blood in, to correct the blood in a new uh, state and decoagulants and measure it. But uh, some report also show that pellet uh, satellitism to only the underestimation of pellet count is very mild and can be neglected. So uh, for this, you can just only report in the CBC by either not collecting uh, the pellet count and report only the pellet satellitism was found, something like this. And this slide, I would like to show you that uh, it is the decision tree for thrombocytopenia when you found the Poly decrease in pellet count, which mostly occur by pseudothrombocytopenia, uh, and its solution that I talked before. So let's move to another another one. Uh, the pitfall of pellet count that uh, can cause the folly increase of the pellet. The first one is the fragmented lead cell. Here. Uh, they show the uh, immune uh, ion deficiency and need a person which had a lot of the labor cell fragments, like a specific and have an extremely uh, microcytosis. 
by the impedance method, it shows a Fourier uh, impedance curve with an absence of a return to a baseline of the platelet. And uh, this have, uh, cannot have uh, a clear position as a cutoff point for the platelet, uh, like a, either for the giant platelet, large platelet, or the microcytic or fragmented platelet by cell. Uh, by using the optical mode, the number of pellet is lower and the graph shows the better separation between the small uh, lead blood cell, this one, and the last uh, pellet. So how to report if you found something like this? You can use another counting method uh, such as uh, manual counting by peripheral blood smear or pellet count to report it instead of the pellet eye. The second one is the cytoplasmic fragments from nucleated cell. These are cytoplasmic fragments are almost uh, came from the malignancy cell and it's mimic, something like this, it's mimic the platelet. Therefore, the platelet count is outer in both impedance and also optical technique. The measurement with fluorescent labeling of pellet is more accurate, but pellet specific immunocounting may be necessary in some cases. However, the simple method is uh, to uh, do the super vital staining with uh, the uh, dry uh, to identify the pseudo pellet and also the pellet, this one. So how to report in this case, you can use another counting like a pellet or, uh, or immunological pellet as, as I mentioned and do specific staining and, and do the manual counting. So the third one, another cause of poly inflated or pellet count is the chiocobulin. Uh, the chiocobulin, the immunoglobulin or immunoglobulin complex uh, with characteristic by precipitation at temperature below uh, 37 degrees Celsius, and this associates after reheating it at 37 degrees Celsius. The present is usually associated with uh, lymphoproliferative syndrome, autoimmune diseases, or hepatitis C. And the cryoprecipitate disturbs the reading of the pellet cow in a small. Uh, precipitate can induce pseudothrombocytosis around here. And how to identify? Uh, Cryoprecipitate are visible when fresh but is examined under an a face contact microscope. And for the peripheral, in the peripheral but near, you can see some morphological like this uh, because the, uh, the cryocarbulin are uh, translucent and colorless. Sometimes you can see something like a pitted surface of the red blood cell. So how to report or cope with this, this, this uh, problem? You can heat the blood sample at uh, 30 degree, 37 degrees Celsius for at least uh, 30 minutes and then rapid reanalysis and report the pellet count. The first one is the lipid. Here it shows the lipemia, create the turbidity of a sample, and is a result of, of the accumulation of uh, lipid particle. The turbidity seen in the lipemia is mainly due to the presence of a uh, chylomicron, and this large particle create a light scatter, resulting in elevated uh, the pellet count when using the pellet O mode. So you can see sometimes a moderate increase of the pellet count. So what to do? Uh, to, you can alter counting method by using a uh, manual counting uh, of the peripheral blood smear or do the immunological pellet count. It can help. So the last one is the microorganism. Uh, although it is very rare, but uh, for increase in the pellet count are report in sample containing the bacteria or the yeast. And such interference may uh, itself 
as an excess of small particle on the pellet uh, volume histogram, this one. And how to record? So you can find the interference or uh, if you found something like bacteria, fungus, or malaria, you should uh, uh, you should uh, stage the microorganism that you found on the bat cow report with the same uh, with the technique uh, of the pellet cow that you use in the report. So this slide shows the summary of the decision key for the thrombocytosis. Uh, and its solution and talk is earlier already. And lastly, I will I would like to end up my talk with an experience using a new optical pellet parameter uh, that was developed in the BC 700 series in my hospital, King Jula Longkorn Memorial Hospital. Uh, this hybrid or we call can call hybrid or pellet edge is a zero cost pellet power parameter which claim that it is accurate with an anti-interference ability. So the pellet edge is a combination uh, pellet algorithm between small uh, pellet cow derived from impedance channel and uh, the large pellet is from uh, the differentiation channel for eliminating the pellet interference. So this one is for the different uh, uh, for the in, in the different channels. The line are led by cell and pellet particle are located in the ghost area of the scattergram. And this one, this particle in the ghost area, if you uh, magnify it, you can find it have a three parts inside. And there are a large pellet uh, which are not interfere with the red blood cell. There's a cell is allowed here. And they also uh, contain the small pellet in this, this, this area also. And they also have the reticulocyte, which have a higher fluorescent signal intensity than the red blood cell here. So this picture shows how the pellet algorithm derived from as I mentioned that the pellet, uh, the smaller one uh, is derived, this one from the pellet uh, impedance channel, and it combined with the large pellet from the differential channel. So that's why we call it a pellet edge or hybrid. So I would like to show that uh, the clinical case that we found in our hospital when we using uh, BC 700 CD at our size. In this case, uh, it is a red blood cell fragmented. Uh, the red blood cell fragmented was fractured by the instrument, and the fragmented red blood cell value is about 3.2 percent. And can, you can see from the histogram. The tail of the pellet histogram was uh, elevated, with suggesting that red blood cell fragment may be present in this sample and cause uh, the fall high pellet cow in pellet eye. And here, when we look uh, at the microscopic exam in the basmia, it revealed the evidence of red blood cell fragment in this in this case. And the comparison of pellet parameter from uh, BC 700 really the pellet I, pellet S, and pellet O. When we compare these three parameters with the flow cytometry, which is a, a reference method, it showed that uh, the pellet H and O was closer to those of the flow cytometry in the presence of labor cell fragment. This data support that pellet edge can accurately measure the pellet cow. So another case is the case that uh, contains the microcytic red blood cell. In this case, a microcytosis was tracked by the instrument. And when we look at MCV, you can see that it was only 61 peptolites. The 
uh, the pellet alarm of the abnormal histogram and the tail uh, of the pellet histogram was also elevated and we suggested the microcytic level tail may be present in this sample and cause the fall high pellet cow. You can see from pellet I. So the microscopic exam revealed the evidence of microcytic pellet cow. And when we compare the pellet uh, three, param three pellet parameter from the BC 700 series with the prostatometer, we also found the same thing that um, pellet H and pellet O were closer to the prostatometry. And this data confirmed that the pellet H can accurately measure the pellet cow in the presence of microcytic labor cell. So before ending this section, uh, there are some take home message about the pellet cow. Uh, although the automated um, cell counter is a backbone of the agnostic laboratory with fast, accurate, and precise pellet cow, the abnormal pellet cow, especially uh, the pseudothrombocytopenia, is become a viable and the bus smear examination still required. The awareness of uh, abnormal automated uh, results that do not conform to the clinical profile can assist uh, to correct uh, the diagnostic. So, uh, thank you for your attention. That, that's all of my talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Judy Tan's uh, introductions. I think that is very, very comprehensive uh, introductions of platelet cow from the characteristic of platelet and also the difficulty of platelet cow and also current pitfalls of platelet cow. As we all know that platelet cow is the most difficult part in the, the cell count like compare with WBC and RBC, yes. And um, my dream also uh, invest or, or I think through a lot of effort to investigate the, the platelet count. So uh, the platelet O and also uh, the multiple platelet count technique is, um, is I think invent for this, this characteristic and also, as mentioned in this uh, slide, we can see that we have a new technologies of platelet age. Platelet age is an economical, yeah, very economical way to, to throw the platelet cow issue. So especially for the, the medium or small size of hospital. So I think that that is very good and sharing. And I, I think that in this slide, Dr. Judy Chan also shared a lot of morphologies of the playlet. So I benefit a lot. And so is there any other questions? Yes, for these sections. I saw in the check box, uh, we have two questions. Yeah. Uh, the number one is multiple count uh, get uh, multiple technique, I think, right? Is it a, a bleak, uh, couple for all hematology machine? Yeah, as far as I know, I think currently multiple count techniques uh, only in uh, MyJ and SysMax. SysMax also have a playlet F, have a multiple count. And the second one, I think, uh, could you see that question, Dr. Tulitan, the second question in the, the Q&A box? Yeah, brilliant from Indonesia. How is the mechanism of economy? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, I okay. How is the mechanism of canamycin or amikacin can reverse the EDTA in the pellet application in vitro? Um, actually, there is unknown mechanism right now. That's why the canamycin or amitacin can can go for the headlet the application. Yes. Okay. 
So I think this on someone that may want to have, yeah, let's, and yeah, I think, yeah, our, uh, um, audience, the question, right? yeah, yeah, they have question, Nisi, yeah. yeah, want to have something to, to, to share, uh, Nisi Pon, Tonya, yeah, I have, yeah, unmute you, yeah, I have unmute you and you can, you can, yeah, speak directly. And another, okay. Okay, so maybe that is a mistake in, in the hands up. Okay, so uh, if there's no more questions, I think let's move to the second part. Okay. And let's, the second part is, yeah, is from uh, our honor speaker, Dr. Francia Chia. Uh, is from St. Louis Med Medical Center, the head of cellular immunologist. So let's, yeah, Dr. Chia, uh, let me hands on this, this platform to you. Okay. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So please go. Good ahead. afternoon. Yeah. So uh, my name is Francis, and to this afternoon, my task is to um, show you some morphologic um, uh, pictures and to sort of uh, give you some sort of technique to in assisting lymphoma diagnosis in peripheral blood um, um, samples. And this is a systematic review in hematology and hematopathology. And I think it's always best to uh, be begin in learning about B-cell lymphomas by understanding something about B-cell development. And as you can see in this old publication, 1970s by Lux, Lux and Collins published in Cancer, uh, there are two basic um, uh, pathways of B cells and T cell development. And because most of the lymphomas that we encounter in daily practice are B cells, and uh, we're going to focus on B cell development and B cell lymphomas for today's talk. And as you can see during those days, uh, this is how they or we understand B cell development. And as you can see, uh, there are B, those B cells that are uh, found in the before the germinal centers or the pre-germinal center B cells. And once these B cells enter the germinal center, they transform into those sort of uh, they call they used to call as the cleave cells and non-cleave cells. And, the, and then they um, exit the germinal centers and become activated large cells. And ultimately what uh, they can they um, um, end up it would be the marginal zone and memory type B cells and plasma and terminal differentiated plasma cells. Uh, can you see my pointer? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. But yeah. things are not as um, easy and not as simple as this anymore. And this is how we tend to understand B cell development during uh, at this time. And as you can see, every step of the of B cell development has their um, associated, na uh, associated names uh, with them. And um, from the most immature um, stage, which is the B lymphoblasts that are seen in the bone marrow, they leave the bone marrow and become circulating naive type B cells. And these naive type B cells, once they sort of um, encounter antigens in the periphery, they um, tend to to transform into different types of cells. And one pathway is that these naive type B cells can develop into short-lived plasma cells. At the same time, uh, there is this, this track that uh, naive B cells, once they are exposed to antigens, they go into the germinal centers of lymphoid tissues where they transform into central blasts or those that are used to be called as non-cleave cells. And they then um, uh, transform and mature into centrocytes, which are uh, previously called as uh, the cleave cells. And this is not a unidirectional process, meaning centrocytes can then become centroblast centroblastic again. 
and the flentrocytes can exit the germinal centers and become uh, trans uh, become transformed into long lived plasma cells. And the subset of these centrocytes can live in the germinal centers and become memory type B cells and marginal zone B cells. But note that there are other steps that actually bypass the germinal centers, like those naive B cells that doesn't pass through the germinal center from the uh, pre-germinal center stage. They go straight to the post-germinal center stage using uh, this alternative track. And there are also there is also this track wherein the marginal zone B cells will uh, go into the mantle uh, zone layer of the of uh, lymph nodes or lymphoid structures forming the mantle zone layer. And as you can see, uh, lymphomas and uh, you know uh, leukemias and lymphomas of a B cell uh, subtype can it can actually trace back in this maturational uh, process. Like B lymphoblastic lymphomas arise when there is proliferation of B lymphoblasts, and when there is proliferation of mantle cell or naive B cells uh, that are pre-germinal center uh, derived uh, that uh, that would give rise to mantle cell lymphoma, and germinal center lymphomas like um, um, follicular lymphoma, Burkitt, diffuse large B cell lymphomas, and um, Hodgkin lymphoma. And for the post-germinal center uh, lymphomas, um, the, uh, the cells that are uh, can be seen post-germinal center uh, would be the marginal zone and mouth lymphomas and lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, CLL and small lymphocytic lymphoma, and a subset of um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma as well, and uh, plasma cell myeloma, of course. So this is a schematic of a normal lymph node and a cartoon of the lymph node. As you can see, there are afferent um, lymphatic uh, channels and there are efferent lymphatic channels. Uh, and, it was, and it is uh, basically covered by a fibrous capsule and with intersected fibrous uh, trabeculae. And uh, note that there are primary follicles without a uh, germinal center. When the uh, lymphoid uh, structure had germinal centers, then it become um, secondary follicles. And this is how it looks like in real life. There is a fibrous capsule and with intercept, intersecting um, fibrous septae. And these are the germinal centers, or so germinal centers meaning secondary follicles with a, a thick rim of, um, of a mantle zone. And, the, and on higher power, this is how it looks like in, on higher power. As you can see, there is a, um, a delineation between the um, more uh, purplish colored uh, mantle zone layer uh, in contrasting to the more uh, pinkish area of the germinal centers. As you can see, there are many um, um, holes within the germinal centers which are occupied by um, histocytes because in the germinal center, this is everything happens. It's uh, it's very active um, active structure in a, in a lymph node. And this is actually where um, my uh, somatic hypermutation, class switch recombination, all those sorts of recombinations actually happen. And so you can see mitosis and you can see um, tangible body macrophages in the germinal center. That's, and that's basically what you can see in a normal germinal center. So in describing um, lymph lymphoid um, structures, there are four broad architectural patterns that we may want to, to know. Uh, follicular or nodular pattern of involvement, sinus pattern, interfollicular or diffuse pattern of involvement. So lymphadenopathy is basically defined as enlargement of lymph nodes. It may be localized or multicentric or a generalized lymphadenopathy. And some at there are um, some locations are more frequently associated with positive agents. So it's very important for us to determine if the lymphadenopathy is reactive in nature or neoplastic in, in nature. So this is the basic approach on how we deal with B cell proliferations. And as you can see, the first thing is that you may want to recognize uh, the lymphocyte as uh, you know, morphology is very important, still is vital for the diagnosis. Immunophenotype flow cytometry is critical in, demo in demonstrating clonality of B cell lymphomas. Immunoarchitecture by the of course uh, immuno immunohistochemistry and of course genetics. Nowadays, genetics has been very important in predicting and um, in and in predicting uh, behavior of disease of uh, lymphomas and for prognostication as well. So this can be aided by means of fish first in cytohybridization and sequencing base assays and molecular testing as well. So these are uh, these are the basic steps that you may for the morphologic um um appear uh, morphologic um 
classification may want to follow these simple steps. So for the first uh, step is to determine if there is a preservation or effacement of lymph node architecture. The second step is to determine the pattern of effacement. Is, is it uh, nodular, vaguely nodular, diffuse um, effacement of the lymphoid architecture? And the third pattern is to, uh, the th third step is to determine the characteristics of the effacing uh, infiltrate, meaning to say, are the cells uh, involved are small cells, intermediate or large cells in morphology. Uh, aside from the appearance of the neoplastic cells, you may also want to look at the uh, population associated with them. Are they associated with some heterogeneous uh, inflammatory cells or are they just a uh, uh, pure mere homog homogeneous population of inflammatory cells? And of course, the distribution of the within the normal uh, nodal um, compartments in which they are found. So for the case one, this is from a 71-year-old male with uh, good physical and mental health, except for uh, reported evidences of lymphadenopathies. The patient is reported to have leukocytosis, white blood cell count of 14, and uh, lymphocyte count of 72. The hemoglobin is 15 and platelet of 243. Upon examination of the peripheral blood, you can see that there is an absolute lymphocytosis. So these purple uh, cells are the lymphocytes, and you can see that these lymphocytes are mature in appearance. They're very purplish in color. The background red blood cells are um, equidistant to one another, so there's no evidence of an overt anemia. The platelets are also adequate in number, but there are these smudge-like cells in the background, which are also... Um, characteristic of this neoplasm. On higher power, you can see that the lymphocytes are sort of mature in appearance. They have this very coarse chromatin pattern, and we tend to describe them as um, um, a soccer ball um, appearance of chromatin or crackmud morphology of, the, of chromatin. On flow cytometry, you know that these are B cells because they're positive with CD20 and CD19, and they're also expressing an ab um, abnormal um, marker, which is CD5. CD5 is a T cell marker, but they're expressed in by these uh, B, cell, um, uh, B cells. And so these are abnormal B cells, and they're also kappa restricted, and they're positive for CD23. And this immunophenotype together with the morphology is, is uh, diagnostic for chronic lymphocytic leukemia or small lymphocytic lymphoma. So this basic mathematical um, 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 calculations are very important for us to diagnose chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So WBC, you multiply that with the percentage lymphocyte and you come up with absolute lymphocyte count. And absolute lymphocyte count, you multiply that with the uh, abnormal or clonal B cells, and then you come up with abnormal B cell count. If the count is less than, is more than five times ten to the nine, then you, you diagnose your your patient as to have chronic lymphocytic leukemia. If the count is less than five times ten to the nine, the diagnosis is monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, or MBL. So the lymph node biopsy of this patient it shows a to total effacement of the lymph no lymphoid architecture. You don't see any evidence of um, reactive germinal centers in this slide. But uh, this, um, this picture shows you some sort of uh, you know, pale areas, nodular areas that are more paler than the other areas. And for me, it's some, it looks something like, uh, looks like this. So there are um, very pale areas, but they're not normal germinal center. The, the um, distinction between the, um, the darker and the paler areas are sort of um, indistinct in this image. And so these are um, totally um, abnormal uh, lymphocytes. On higher power, we can see that the infiltrate is made up of these small lymphocytes, very mature in appearance, in morphology, similar to the cells that you saw in the peripheral blood, as I showed you a while ago. And on higher power, in those paler areas, you can see other cells aside from these uh, dark and mature um, lymphocytes. You can also see these larger ones. This cell right here is um, much more larger than the and more paler than the uh, mature lymphocyte. And this is a pro-lymphocyte. And this one right here is um, a lymphocyte that has 
even larger than the prolymphocyte and it has centrally located nucleoli. And this is a para, this is called a paraimmunoblast. So chronic lymphocytic lymphoma, small lymphocytic, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic lymphoma is diagnosed by having a immunophenotype of CD5, CD23, and CD200 a positivity, and they're usually negative for CD10 and FMC7 by flow cytometry. And uh, they also are monotypic for um, light chains, and they're, but immunohistochemistry is similar from the above immunophenotype, except that the CD20 is often uh, uniformly strong, but not always. Uh, this is the NCCN um, criteria on how we deal with um, diseases, and for this one, chronic lymphocytic or CLL, small lymphocytic lymphoma, um, the first step is that there should be a hematopathology review on the peripheral blood and all slides or at least one paraffin block representative of the tumor if the diagnosis was made on a lymph node or in bone marrow biopsy. But a flow cytometry of the blood is adequate for diagnosis of CLL, small lymphocytic lymphoma, and biopsy is generally not required. Even bone marrow biopsy, you don't need a uh, bone marrow aspiration to diagnose CLL. But aside from morph morphological and flow cytometric uh, findings, they also recommend to do uh, testing, genetic testing like FISH to determine aneuploidies like trisomy uh, 12 and deletion 7, 11Q, deletion um, 13Q, and uh, deletion of 17P. Also, aside from FISH, you also may want to do sequencing like uh, TP50, uh, T TP53 uh, testing and sequencing, and of course, uh, molecular uh, analysis using testing of immuno immunoglobulin heavy chain or IG IGHV mutational status. So basically, aside from morphology, you may want to do cytogenetics, uh, cell of origin analysis, and mutational testing as well. So if you may take a look at this cardiogram of a patient with CLL, you may actually be right when you see something that is uh, this, any abnormality you may see here is, um, I don't know, but this is a totally normal um, cardiogram. So when you do uh, cardiotyping in CLL uh, patients, you may always, almost always, you can see normal cardiogram, but, and therefore you may need to do fish testing for us to see some cryptic abnormalities. And this, these, are the tar uh, this, uh, these are the chromosomes that you may want to target. Uh, you may want to look at chromosome 13 because this is the most common um, abnormality in CLL found in 50% of the cases, followed by 11Q deletion, trisomy 12, and um, 17P uh, deletion, which involves the TP53 gene. So it's very easy to remember, right? 11, 12, 13, 17. It's, it is important for us to do cytogenetics or FISH in CLL because the prognosis survival difference of these patients. So patients with uh, P17, P deletion tend to, um, to, to have a worse prognosis as compared to those patients with 11, uh, Q, 11 Q deletion and um, 13 um, Q deletion. And those patients with trisomy 12 and normal, cytogen, uh, normal cytogenetics have intermediate sort of uh, prognosis. So aside from um, cytogenetics, you may also want to determine cell of origin status. As we discussed earlier, a subset of um, chronic lymphocytic, uh, a subset of the lymphocytes bypasses the germinal center, right? So you have like the pre-germinal center CLL, and they're called the non-mutated uh, or naive, B, naive uh, CLL uh, cells, and there are those cells that are found that arise post-germinal center or the that have the mutated immunoglobulin heavy chains. And they're called uh, memory type B cells. As I said earlier in the germinal center, that's where um, most of the events actually happen. You can see mutations in the germinal center. And then, and therefore, when the CLL um, traverses the germinal center and pass through the germinal center, then you eventually lead to have a lead to, um, to, to get a, a mutated immunoglobulin heavy chains. Why is it important to determine cell of origin of CLL? It's important because uh, the prognosis is also different in those patients with mutated and non-mutated um, um, CLL. So when you have mutated CLL, you have better prognosis as, com as, as compared to the unmutated CLL. 
aside from um, cytogenetics and um, uh, there are also a long tail of uh, gene mutations you can see in CLL, small lymphocytic lymphoma. So TP53, it is routinely should be tested in all cases of CLL, ATM gene mutation, Notch1, SF3B1, MED15, and all these sorts of, um, of mutations. So what is monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis? So MBL of monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis, when the peripheral blood lymphocyte count or the monoclonal B cells uh, population count is less than or up to five times 10 to the nine, either with CLL phenotype, a typical CLL phenotype or non-CLL phenotype uh, B cells in the absence of other lymphomatous features. And they may have a uh, bone marrow involvement with no maximum cutoff. So uh, for the diagnosis of monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, you only need to have a peripheral blood and flow cytometry and then if you have a count of less than five times set to the nine, then you have the diagnosis of monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis. It, it leads to a major impact on our diagnostic practice because most monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis don't progress to CLL, to an overt CLL. But they said that um, most CLL um, came from monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis. Okay. Enough, enough uh, with CLL and let's go uh, to case number two. So this is, a f this is from a 42-year-old female with reported history of extensive lymph adenopathy and pancytopenia. Lymph node and bone marrow biopsy was, uh, were, uh, were performed. When you take a look at the peripheral blood, you can see that the lymphocytes are um, not normal in appearance. As you can see, the these lymphocytes are um, cleaved and they're, um, um, they have this indentation um, and cleft. And in flow cytometry, we can see that these lymphocytes are also um, abnormal lymphocytes because they are kappa restricted. They are B cells. They are, sorry, they are B cells and they are expressing CD10. And so these are also abnormal uh, B cells. The lymph node biopsy shows uh, something like this. And these are, uh, which, as you can see, there is, um, there is um, um, nodular pattern of involvement. As you can see, the nodules are made up of uh, this sort of uh, paler areas, which uh, actually mimics a normal germinal center. But, but note that they are sitting back to back from one another. And there is a thin rim of, um, of mantle, mantle zone. And so this is uh, typic typical for the diagnosis of follicular lymphoma. And in follicular lymphoma, what you see are these um, similar cells that you saw from the, from the peripheral blood I showed you a while ago. There are uh, these cleave cells and there are these larger cells. Um, and then in immunohistochemistry, you can see that the the follicles are positive for BCL2, and these are this is pathognomonic for uh, follicular lymphoma. So these follicles are B cells; they're CD10 positive and they're BC, BCL2 positive. This is CD3, and they're negative for CD3. The bone marrow biopsy shows diffuse infiltration of the bone marrow, and in and CD uh, in a uh, and in immunohistochemistry of the bone marrow, you see you can see a uh, uh, paratrabecular infiltrates of uh, the infiltrates. So these are the lymphoma, lymphoma cells in follicular lymphoma. So in follicular lymphoma, we tend to grade them based on the number of centroblasts. So if you may want to return to the to the previous slides, these uh, centroblasts are the cells that have uh, that are larger and have um, um, peripheral uh, localizations of, of um, nucleoli. And these are the centrocytes. Those cleave cells are the, are the centrocytes and the larger ones are the centroblasts. And in grading uh, follicular lymphoma, we tend to uh, score them based on the number of centroblasts per high power field. If the count is more than 15, then we grade them as grade three or high grade. If the grade is uh, less than 15, that's uh, low grade. Um, aside from uh, counting number of centroblasts in uh, follicular lymphoma, we also may want to determine the pattern of involvement, follicular, diffused, and diffuse or mixed uh, pattern. So follicular lymphoma is defined by or is, um, is uh, uh, traditionally 
known to have the uh, canonical translocation of 1418. However, only 85% of the of the cases, uh, you, you see the, the, the translocation 1418. In 15% of the cases, you don't see the translocation. And not all 1418 translocation positive cases are follicular lymphoma. You can do immunohistochemistry in differentiating follicular lymphoma and um, reactive follicular hyperplasia, but follicular lymphoma versus other small B-cell lymphomas, you can, it's, sometimes it's very difficult to perform um, IHE alone, so you need to, to perform, you need to, to, to correlate with morphology as well. And, and uh, there are rare cases wherein there is a translocation 14 18 positive by fish, but the immunohistochemistry is negative for BCL2. It is due to uh, point mutation of the of the BCL2 uh, gene leading to um, truncation of the um, BCL2 um, receptor for in immunohistochemistry, and it's found in 50% of follicular lymphoma. And there are also these follicular lymphomas that are negative for 1418. Those follicular lymphomas that are seen in the testicle, in the skin, pediatric type follicular lymphoma, grade three B, and diffuse inguinal type, and those that are blastoid in appearance. So aside from cytogenetics and uh, immunohistochemistry, we can also um, determine the uh, behavior of follicular lymphoma by using. Um, molecular methods by mutations of histone modifying genes, and there is this seven gene risk model of um, of uh, in follicular lymphoma, EZH2, RDA1, RDA1A, MF2B, EP300, and all these sorts of mutations. And aside from that, there are these panel of panels of mutations that say if you have this twenty uh, this uh, twenty three gene panel. When you have this, you have a higher progression for a uh, large cell lymphoma transformation. And so somehow it sort of um, helpful in predicting the behavior of follicular lymphoma. But right now at to this, uh, at to this uh, time point, um, we seldomly use uh, perform this testing. Okay, now for case number three, this is from a 60-year-old male with reported history of lymph adenopathy and lymphocytosis as well as anemia. So this is a, an interesting case. As you can see, this is the peripheral blood. There are many abnormal looking mononuclear cells here. And as you can see, most of the cells have you know, var varied appearance. They have this intermediate size. There are this, um, um, this um, lefted um, cell here I'm pointing at. And there are many of these cells that are that appears like blast. And this so there are these blastoid appearing cells um, that have um, that uh, they 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 have uh, prominent nucleoli. These paler areas are the nucleoli, and their and the chromatin pattern is immature in appearance. And the background red cells are are uh, they're they're spaced out, and so there are some sort of anemia. And so basically, we may we might mistake these cases as to have leukemia, right? Because they look like blast. And on higher power, there is there are these uh, clefted and uh, cleaved cells. You have these uh, blastoid appearing cells, and there are this mixture of um, intermediate and small cells. So in flow cytometry, so there are these uh, different uh, pictures of uh, the cells that we see in this case. Uh, but in flow cytometry, we can see that there is this abnormal uh, B cells that also express CD5, similar to the case that I showed you from the from CLL case, right? But this doesn't look like CLL in the first place because they look blast blastoid in appearance. They don't look like the mature uh, lymphocytes, and they're also positive for kappa. Um, so they're uh, clonal uh, BCD uh, CD5 expressing B cells. So this is a case of mantle cell lymphoma. And as you can see, mantle cell lymphoma can be diagnosed by immunohistochemistry by doing uh, cyclin D1 immunostaining in, uh, in tissue biopsies. But there are these cases of cyclin D1 negative mantle cell lymphoma. But lo and behold, we have another marker, which is uh, SOX11, which is very helpful in cases, difficult cases of mantle cell lymphoma. In, uh, in subset of patients that are um, cycling D1 negative mantle cell lymphoma, you, you can use SOX11 for the diagnosis. 
This is due to um, variant um, translocations aside from cyclin D1, like for this case, cyclin D2 translocation. So there are these morphologic variants of mantle cell lymphoma. You have the blastoid a variant, those that looks like lymphoblast. They, you have pleomorphic variants, small cell variant, and marginal zone variant. And so morphology can be deceiving at times, like for this one, if you might uh, want to to call this as blast and you're you're already wrong right because they are lymphomas and so uh sometimes we really need to do um um immunophenotyping by flow and of course we need to have a good um preparation of the smear so mantle cell lymphoma uh due, due to the translocation of 1114 or cyclin D1 immunoglobulin heavy chain translocation, which leads to upregulation of cyclin D1 expression. And cyclin D1 immunosechemistry is fairly specific, but can also be found in diffuse large B cell lymphomas, chronic lymphocytic, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, especially in those uh, cases with proliferation centers, um, Hodgkin, um, hairy cell leukemia, Langerhans cell histocytosis, uh, Rosai Dorfman diseases, plasma cell myeloma, anaplastic large cell, and nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. And therefore, um, um, doing just cycling D1 can be, um, can be difficult at times because there are some mimics as well. So aside from immunosochemistry, there are these uh, mutations as well that are recurrently mutated in uh, in here in mantle cell lymphoma, like ATM, TP53, and cycling D1. And there are those cases that I said earlier that are cycling D1 negative mantle cell lymphoma can be due to mutations of cycling uh, D2, cycling D3, and SOX11. But they can still be mantle cell lymphoma. So the pathogenesis for uh, mantle cell lymphoma is that, as we discussed earlier, those cells that naive cells that situate into the mantle zone uh, will give rise to mantle cell lymphoma. But there is this um, subset of mantle cells that goes into the germinal center, um, creating a hypermutated immunoglobulin heavy chain. And those cases that enter the germinal center will end up to, uh, to the leukemic or splenic variant of mantle cell lymphoma. And those cases usually are negative for SOX11. And those cases that that doesn't um, or that uh, doesn't enter the germinal center and situate themselves into the into the mantle zone area are the classic um, nodal uh, mantle cell lymphoma and they're usually the ones that are um, SOX11 positive and these cases can you know have blastoid morphology. So then again, these are all mantle cell lymphoma morphologies. So. This is a um, small cell variant of mantle cell lymphoma with a prominent hyalinized blood vessel here. You can see blastoid appearance. This looks like a blast, but they're not blast because they're mantle cell lymphomas. These are the more pleomorphic variants, and this is cyclin D1 immunohistochemistry. So as you can see here, the uh, gene expression profile of uh, mantle cell lymphoma is different from that of Burkitt lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, PMBL or uh, primary mediastinal B cell lymphomas, and uh, follicular lymphoma. And so this is really a distinct entity. Okay, now for the case, for the last case, this is from a 52-year-old female with massive splenomegaly and monocytosis as counted from the um, from peripheral blood smear, uh, from the um, CBC analyzer. And when, when we uh, take a look at the peripheral blood smear, we can see this um, around uh, appearing uh, lymphocytes. And we are all familiar with these lymphocytes from our, um, from our hematology course, right? And uh, they have these frayed uh, borders and they look like hairy cells, right? And this, in fact, are hairy cell leukemia. And so hairy cell leukemia, they usually situate in the monocyte gate in, in flow cytometry and they can be mistaken as monocytes, but they're not monocytes, they're hairy cell, they're lymphocytes and they're lymphocytes because they're CD20 positive, right? And they're expressing CD103. And so this is a diagnosed case of hairy cell leukemia. So hairy cell leukemia is, can, is uh, due to some uh, mutations as well. So there is this BRAF B600E mutation that is found in over 
uh, in nearly 100% of the cases. And so it's very, you know, very difficult. You can diagnose here cell leukemia by doing um, uh, BRAF mutation. But of course, BRAF B600E mutation is not exclusive, of course, in here cell leukemia. It can be seen in other uh, um, neoplasms as well. And uh, what is BRAF? BRAF is uh, downstream of RAS pathway and they're upstream of MAP kinase pathway. And there is this variant that are usually BRAF negative. They call it uh, from the uh, WHO as hairy cell leukemia variant. But on the upcoming WHO um, fifth edition, it will be removed and will be um, named under the umbrella of splenic B cell lymphoma or leukemia with prominent nucleoli in the uh, fifth um fifth uh, edition of WHO. And this is the basic immunophenotype of hairy cell leukemia. So CD11, C, CD25, 103, 123, 200, and Cyclin Cycline D1 also is positive in hairy cell leukemia and BRAF. So this is a bone marrow sample from a patient with hairy cell leukemia. Where, are the hairy cell leukemia? Where is the hairy cell leukemia in this image? So they are this... Um, populations of, um, of uh, round cells here that I am pointing at. There are this uh, fried egg appearance in um, tissue sections. There are these beautifully um, dispersed uh, megaparasites. And so these are the hairy cell leukemia uh, slides. So this is a bone marrow sample of this case. So for the summary, we can do immunophenotyping to, you know, to diagnose diseases aside from morphology, of course. So you can use morphology for screening. So for the um, basic um, um, diagnostic algorithm, we can we see that the uh, the lymphocyte they are B cells because they're CD uh, twenty positive. We can we can uh, we can check for if it, if the cells are CD five positive. If CD five positive, you do cyclin D one. And if it's positive for cyclin D one, it's most of most likely it's mantle cell lymphoma. And if it's negative for cyclin D1, we can do CD23, CD200, and then you can diagnose CLS, small lymphocytic lymphoma. And, of, and, and diffuse large B cell lymphoma can sometimes be CD5 positive as well in a minority of the cases. If the CD20 positive, CD5 negative, you can do CD10. And then you do BCL6, so you can see if uh, you can diagnose follicular lymphoma, diffuse starch B-cell lymphoma, and Burkitt lymphoma as well. If CD5 is negative, CD10 negative, you can do BCL6. With when it's negative, um, can um, that's that's that can be um, marginal zone or mouth lymphomas, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, hairy cell leukemia, and um, diffuse starch B-cell lymphoma. And BCL6 positive, you can subsets of hair, diffuse starch B-cell lymphoma can be BCL6 as well. So these are some of the other slides that I want to show you. So of course, it's also very, aside from the, the, the genetics and immunophenotyping, um, morphology is still very important for the diagnosis and recognition of these lymphomas. As you, can, as you can see in this image, these are not normal appearing um, lymphocytes, right? Because they are uh, clefted and they are, um, they are clefted and um, cleaved. And so this is a case of hairy cell leukemia in the peripheral blood. Okay. Another case is um, this is another uh, case of a patient with lymphocytosis. As you can see, there are, you know, there are convolution convolutions in this lymphocyte right here. As you can see, there are uh, folds. If you take a deeper look on them, you can see that they appear like um, brain or cerebriform appearance. They are convoluted. And this is a case of Cesar of Cesar syndrome. These are Cesar cells. Uh, before we tend to, you know, to count these um, cleave cells, but it's very difficult to do nowadays. And then, and therefore, we can uh, diagnose um, Cesar uh, Cesar syndrome uh, based on the presence of of uh, on the on. Uh, by the use of flow cytometry, if there is lymphocytosis, these are uh, T cell lymphomas as opposed from the B cell lymphomas that I that we discussed from the first four cases. And if you take a look at my, uh, the deeper look of the um, of the um, nuclei, nuclei of these uh, Cesare cells, you can see that they are convoluted. And the, when you do um, um, tissue biopsy, the skin biopsy, you can see. Um, 
uh, this is CD3 stain. There are prominence of CD3 that are found in the epidermis of this patient with um, Cesare, uh, Cesare uh, syndrome cases. And so this is mycosis fungoides associated with Cesare cells. So therefore, they have a Cesare syndrome. Okay, that's all I'm going to say for uh, today's case. And these are some other uh, morphologic um, clues that you can say that this may probably not a normal lymphocyte. Like um, CLL, as we discussed earlier, you, you can see that CLL cells are mature in appearance, coarse chromatin pattern, right? Um, soccer ball appearance, rachmad appearance of the chromatin, follicular lymphoma, they're usually cleaved and folded um, uh, nuclei, uh, convoluted nuclei in cases of Cesare syndrome, so Cesare cells, hairy cell or vigus cytoplasm have these free borders. You have a hairy cell leukemia, a splenic marginal zone lymphoma. So these are the things that you may need to 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 um to think about. Plasma cytoid, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, uh, the lymphocytes that are that have abundant cytoplasm with cytoplasmic granules. Those cases can be a form of T large lymphocytic leukemia or NK cell leukemia or TLGLs, prominent nucleoli uh, pro lymphocytic leukemias, T and B, and variant hairy cell leukemia and uh, mantle, cell, mantle cell lymphomas as well. And of course, there are, there are those intermediate to large size um, cells you can see in the circulation at, uh, at times. And very important for is the recognition of the cytoplasmic vacuoles, cytoplasmic vacuoles in Burkitt lymphoma. Okay, that's all I'm going to say, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chia. Yeah, it is very, uh, I think, very different um, perspective from, from this topic, morphologies. Yeah, we can see that you give us a, a, a several case of the how to uh, diagnose different lymphoma. Yeah, I think you are open a really big horizontal of our lab technician. Yeah, what uh, to diagnose a disease and uh, what we need to consider, not only the hematology, the, the basic uh, CBC test, but also the peripheral, uh, peripheral uh, blood smear uh, finding and also the flow cytometry result and also fish test. So that is a, a very, I think, very complicated uh, logic or, or very, I think, uh, is an, an algorithm of the diagnosis, but it, that is good for our lab professional. So we can think about what our tests can link to the disease and what can link to a patient. Yeah, we can think about the test, I think, more real. It, it is not only an, a number, but it's linked to the disease. So I, I think, thank you. And yeah, yeah, you open and very and uh, uh, horizontal for, for our lab professional. Let's see that uh, what uh, 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 what question we have in the check box or our Q and A box. Okay. So yeah, let's see. Uh, there's another. Yeah. There, but I think this one may be um, related to the last topic. Uh, brilliant from Indonesia. Uh, incubation, the ETTA sample in 37 degree can reverse the uh, pseudothrombocytopenia. So that is caused by coplanet agglutinin, uh, uh, right? Uh, I think this question may be uh, is want to ask Dr. Chulita? Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, if it can reverse the pseudothrombocytopenia when you incubate at uh, 37 degrees Celsius, that means it's caused by the core uh, pellet agglutinin. Is it like? Mm -hmm. This is correct. Yeah. yeah. And another, I think, how do we differentiate downy shell in infectious mononucleases? What parameter must we look? 
yeah, I think that question, um, I can't, I think that question is for my lecture. So yeah. downy cells are the activated large lymphocytes that can be mistaken for blast out oftentimes. So downy cells has three types. They have uh, downy type 1, type 2, type 3. These are the traditional ways that we deal with um, with morphology, right? And downy cells uh, like type 1 are the ones that are very small, no, like normal appearing um, lymphocyte. And downy type 2 are those that have abundant um, cytoplasm that has um, cytoplasmic granules with them. They are often, um, uh, they, they appear like that of a large granular lymphocyte. And downy type 3 is the one that is very large, very abnormal looking. Uh, what parameter we, mu we must look? Um, I think, um, of course, flow cytometry can be very um, helpful in differentiating if, uh, if the lymphocyte is reactive or is it neoplastic. Uh, and in infectious mononucleosis, you may also want to look at the patient uh, themselves if, if the patient has like um, cervical lymphadenopathy or ton, uh, enlargement of the tonsils, uh, those are the, uh, and um, they have um, infection, uh, they are um, positive for like EBV infection, of course, and that's uh, very um, helpful in differentiating patients with infection mononucleus because sometimes even in biopsy samples, it's very difficult to, to determine to, to know if it's infectious it's, uh, infectious mononucleosis is uh, very tricky to discern yeah uh, in in our in our um in, on our end and so we need to do other tests as well okay so let's see whether they have a uh, question Okay, so I think, yeah. Someone raise their hand, yes. So you can, yeah, unmute, yeah, I, I will unmute you and you can, yeah, to, to raise. Okay. Hey, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. It's my uh, voice is clear. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question for Dr. Francisco Tia. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. I have two questions, Doctor. Number one is, uh, when do we refer to lymphoproliferative disease as uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia or lymphoma? And uh, secondly, have you experienced the transformation of acute lymphoblastic leukemia and relapse into lymphoma because uh, we meet the case, uh, the morphology after therapy is resembled to Burkitt lymphoma or lymphoma. <laughs> we don't, uh, uh, we not, we are not sure. And how to make sure what antibodies for immunophenotyping are used? Thank you very much. Sorry for the first case. Yes, yeah, I'm Ratna from Indonesia. Sorry for the first, what's the first key? first uh, question again, sorry. Okay, when you uh, refer to lymphoproliferative disease as acute lymphoblastic leukemia or as lymphoma? Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, so basically leukemia, when you say leukemia, it's uh, involvement of um, peripheral blood, right? And you don't usually see, uh, you don't usually see um, lymphadenopathies and some other um, organ, solid organ involvement. And so if you have, um, I, I, so that's basically the definition of leukemia. We can, you have uh, bone marrow and uh, peripheral blood involvement of the, of the um, neoplastic cells. So look, acute leukemia is basically the uh, presence of blast or the immature, um, immature cells. You can see them in the peripheral blood, in the bone marrow. And so sometimes really by morphology, it's very difficult to differentiate between uh, a lymphoma like what I showed you from the from my presentation in like in the case in 
such in the case of mantle cell lymphoma, the lymphomas are sometimes, uh, mantle cell lymphoma can present as blastoid cells. They, they look really, they really look like um, um, blast. And so uh, in my practice, I, I don't usually um, say that I saw like um, a blast in the peripheral blood. I, I can just say like uh, a typical mononuclear cells found in the, in the blast, circulating in the blast. Uh, by morphology, it's blastoid in appearance. And then I recommend flow cytometry because in lymphomas, uh, the, the, it's, uh, lymphomas are usually mature uh, lymphocytes, right? And then, and therefore, they can be differentiated from leukemia, which are immature lymphocytes by by means of flow cytometry. And by, by flow cytometry, you can uh, you, be, you use the CD forty five and side scatter um, uh, plot, and and lymphomas usually goes into the uh, you know the lymphocyte gate. Most of them goes into the lymphocyte gate, and and uh, blast goes to the blast gate, and so. Um, you need to do flow cytometry to differentiate. Okay, about the classification of ELL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, uh, the bursting lymphoma is uh, close to lymphoma or leukemia. Ah, yeah, yeah. So before uh, Burkitt lymphoma, um, I think uh, years ago, we tend to classify Look, uh, lymphoblastic leukemia as to L1, L2, L3, right? If you can yes. actually remember that, that uh, that's an old classification. But right now we don't do that classification um, nowadays. Before Burkitt lymph, lymph leuke Burkitt lymphoma leukemia is L3, but right now that's totally a lymphoma. So it's basically a mature type of uh, neoplasm. So the Burkitt lymphoma is a lymphoma. Can be seen in the bone marrow and in the other soft and other um solid organs as well, lymph node as well. Okay, so we must revise the um classification FAP, yeah, France. Yeah. For yeah, yeah. Lymph, uh, for so FAP right now we follow. So right now we follow the WHO classification, and Burkitt okay. lymphoma is now uh different from leukemia. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you very much, Doctor. Yeah, greeting from Indonesia. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chick, and thank you, Dr. Francis. Uh, let's see another, yeah, another doctor. One, two. Hello, Dr. Farida Hamniza. Yeah, you can. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah, I think I have already unmuted. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe it's a, a misclick. So let's see whether they, we have any other questions. Yeah. Yeah, I think by far is clear for the, the question section. Okay, so yes, uh, thanks uh, everyone for, for your time to join this, this webinar. I think that is a very good uh, communications um, uh, for the topic. I think for the first topic, uh, we talk about uh, more, focus most on the lab I think lab detection, yeah, for the platelets, the most difficult part of the platelet detection. So Dr. Chudi-chan shared a lot of the ex experience. I think it is a very, uh, I think, valuable experience on the uh, on the platelet detection, and, and it may is it is it mistaken, yeah, for the platelet count. And also is very crucial in the, the diagnosis and also for the platelet, it may link to, to the, the further uh, medical action like the surgery and any risks of the, the medical action. So it's very crucial and we benefit a lot for, for the introduction of the solutions. 
And the second topic, uh, Dr. Francis uh, has shared us uh, uh, algorithms of the leukemia diagnosis and also uh, our morphologies detections and also morphology characteristic uh, serve at a very basic uh, role in the diagnosis. So uh, for our lab technician, I think provide a very correct and a very valuable hint or clue to a physician is very crucial. So thanks uh, for our speaker's sharing. So I think then uh, for the next topic, uh, I, will, uh, I will make another service of our, our audience. Uh, what's your interesting topic? And we will continue to to I think to look for this kinds of topic and what is your main concerns in the lab detection and what you you need to know about what a physician think about the test and let's see that uh, what we have in the episode three and thank you all for your attentions and for your yeah yeah joining for this this uh, webinar episode two. And thanks for our speaker. And this, I think, this is all for today's uh, web uh, today's uh, webinar. So thank you all. Bye bye. If you have any other questions uh, regarding our webinar, please contact me or contact our uh, local representative. And yeah, we would like to yeah help. Thank you and may see you next episode. Thank you all.